Please welcome Mary Ann Wayman. So this forward. Green is forward. That's back. And if you need your notes, they're right there. Okay. If you have any questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, it's going to be a great event. We're going to learn a lot today. Okay. So for those who don't know me, my name is Mary Ann Wayman. And I am the president of CCAN. And I also am the founder, co-founder with Robert. So. There we go. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how CCAN Zebra Scottish Stripes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, once upon a time, there was a woman who didn't feel well. She went to doctor and doctor, telling them about the pain that I had endured, and telling them that I was really having a lot of diarrhea, very bad stomach pains, um, rectal bleeding so bad that I actually needed a transfusion. And everybody kind of said to me, don't worry about it. Everything's fine. It's IBS or whatever. After seven years, seven doctors, seven colonoscopies, we finally found the tumor. So I got diagnosed in um, February of 2001 after searching since 2000, uh, 1994. And uh, when we found it, I was very happy and relieved. Even though it was cancer, I had an answer, and I had a name to what was going on. Um, so CCAM was formed, and we formed in order to bring educational programs like this for patients, because there really wasn't enough out there. Um, and so what we want to do is increase awareness to patients, to caregivers, to physicians, and to the world. Patients needed a place to get the facts, to needed to talk to somebody who understood what they were going through. This is why we have the phone line open seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I've known I spoke to many of you on the phone. We started doing advocacy, so we started doing radio spots, we started doing some TV with work with uh, Novartis. Um, in 2010, I won the P Ma Monica Warner Patient Advocacy Award, which was a great honor. We gave, got a $10,000 grant from Novartis, and, um, and it was in honor of Monica Warner, who was R Dr. Richard Warner's wife, um, who was a very, very strong advocate for this community. So who is CCAN? We were um, formed in uh, 2004. Um, actually, I started doing the support group in 2003. Um, and we wanted to promote the awareness of carcinoid and nets. And uh, we also assist support groups around the country. Um, they, we cannot financially help them, but we give them materials and help them get uh, things going off the ground. So if anybody wants to start a local support group, please contact me and we'd be happy to do so. We also fund research. We distribute information from the pharmaceutical companies. We also record a lot of these um, conferences, so they're available on DVD for you. And they're also available on the website. Uh, we do have the 2012 National Conference available on DVD outside. And with the $10 donation, you could get a copy. Um, as the end of the year comes in 2013, we would produce over 30 conferences for patients. We have reached thousands and thousands of patients. This is what my house looks like the day before. But actually, this isn't even close to what it really looks like. <laughs> we live in a three-bedroom home with no basement, no attic, and a garage. And it is packed to the gills. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, we have uh, three events this uh, month. So we are tripled the amount of stuff in my dining room. As you can see here, um, these are one of the couple of the conferences that we've done. Um, we do annual fundraising events. We do the Strides for Stripes in Eisenhower Park. We started that five years ago, and it was a great success. Even last year, after Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Sandy hit, we didn't think we were going to get many people to attend. But we still had over 200 people there, which was really, really great. We've had as many as six to 800 people there. 
And uh, one year we had the Islanders there. We have a band, we give breakfast, we uh, a con continental breakfast, and we give lunch and stuff like that. And it's a lot of fun, we bring the families together. We also do a celebration of life. And this year we're really excited because it's our 10th anniversary. Um, we have over 110 prizes there for the patients and caregivers. We try to keep it low cost for you to attend. We try to keep it at, I believe it's going to be at 90 $95, approximately $95. Unlike other foundations who charge five, six hundred dollars a plate, we try to keep it low. So we want the patients to come. We want to celebrate your life, another year of being alive, and another year that we're working together to fight this cancer. Since 2003, 2004, we've distributed over three uh, 300,000 bracelets all over the world. We've also, ooh, did we get two more research? There we go. We've given money to research to the Costanoid Cancer Foundation, New York Presbyterian Hospital, um, Hurricane Katrina uh, hit LSU and they lost their lab. We raised money for them. We've done the Dr. Cancer Foundation. We did the Feinstein Institute in New York. Um, and we've also helped a little bit with the University of Iowa with their clinical trial. Okay, everybody wants to say, why is the zebra our mascot? Well, you know, there's two reasons. One, in medical school, when hearing hoofbeat, they're taught, when hearing hoofbeat, think of horses, not zebras. Nets are relatively rare, so it's thought to be a zebra. But the real reason is, as with our fingerprint, every zebra has a different print. No two zebras have the same stripes, and no two patients sitting in this room right now have the same symptoms, respond to the medication the same way, and that's why we're really called zebras. Okay. <laughs> this is cute. Um, how do you find uh, a zebra when you're looking for a, a horse? Um, I'm sure many of you have been told, take two aspirins, go home, call me in the morning if you're not feeling better. Okay, as you all know, neuroendocrine tumors grows in, a, uh, grows in the hormone-producing cells found throughout the body. Uh, most prevalent symptoms are um, abdominal pain, flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, bloating, heart palpitations, weakness, skin rash, heartburn, and the most important one that nobody ever puts on the list is fatigue. There's a lot of people out here that have a hard time getting out of bed every day. And it's most commonly misdiagnosed as IBS or Crohn's disease. And anybody who has it in their lungs are also, also um, diagnosed with asthma. A lot of doctors, not our specialists, but a lot of doctors believe that, that it's benign, no meds, no follow-up it's needing. There's nothing new out there on the horizon. And believe me, everybody has been working hard. There is a lot of new drugs and a lot of new things going on. And a lot of doctors believe that tumor re removal cures the patient. Most of us are misdiagnosed. Over 90% of us are misdiagnosed. And from the time of our symptoms to the time of our diagnosis can average anywhere close to five to seven years. This is unacceptable. And I ask you to be an advocate, and Robert will go into that later. You need to spread the word. Wear your bracelets, wear your pins. Anybody that you meet into, speak to them because you never know if you're saving somebody's life by just coming out and saying, I was misdiagnosed. If you're having these symptoms, go and get checked out. Sometimes little um, blood tests or all that we need or urine tests. And what is the key to fight against neck cancer is actually you have to be your own advocate, and you have to be an advocate for the disease. Um, our neuroendocrine cancer specialists, and we have great teams. We have wonderful doctors around the world, and Robert and I work very closely with a lot of them. And we um, actually uh, work with them really well, and we're trying to grow nanets to get more doctors involved. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to those who don't know NET, seems like a witch doctor or a magic potions. Today's presenters, we have 
Hal Gerstein, Dr. Stephen Labuti, Dr. Richard Warner, Dr. Eric Liu, Dr. J Jerome Zacks, and Dr. Thomas Odoricio. Um, the best knowledge, uh, basic knowledge of nets is, uh, best, sorry, best knowledge of what nets are. Know what questions to ask your doctor. You can and you should be part of the discussion regarding your care and treatment. These, uh, there are treatments out there for you. So this is what you're going to go away with today. You're going to learn everything that you need to make sure that you get proper treatment. So I'd like to welcome my doc, <laughs> who I've been with for 23 years, Dr. Hal Gerstein. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann, for uh, a brilliant introduction. Uh, not much more for me to say after that but uh, we'll try. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a very important conference, I think, for all of us. I've been doing this for a couple of years now, and I think today's conference is going to be a little unique in that this is going to be a, this is going to be a little bit of a how-to kind of conference, and there's going to be a lot of takeaway points for all of us. Uh, my topic is uh, prioritizing treatment options for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Okay. All right. Um, first, a little bit about what I do and how I um, relate to, to um, the group here. I am a medical oncologist. I'm a general medical oncologist, and I treat all cancers. I'm in private practice. I'm in one of these guys that we call in the trenches. I'm seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis uh, uh, with many different cancers, neuroendocrine tumors being one of them. I rely on the experts that are here today. So in addition to me giving you this overview, I'm going to be learning just as much as you are today, hopefully. Uh, we're going to talk today about um, how I, as a general medical oncologist, approach patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors has been known in the past, and still are known, as carcinoid tumors. Uh, this type of tumor was first uh, identified in the early 1900s uh, as a unique pathologic entity when uh, it was found, uh, patients were found to have cancer cells that were kind of like carcinomas, but not really carcinomas. So they called it carcinoid or carcinoma-like. Uh, unfortunately, as Marianne mentioned, uh, it was thought that many of these patients had, these tumors were benign in many of these patients. They weren't quite real carcinomas or real cancers. Not true. All carcinoids, all neuroendocrine tumors are malignant. They have the potential of spreading. Some may not spread as quickly as others and may take years, but they all have that potential. And they all, all patients with neuroendocrine tumors need to be treated as cancer patients. Uh, the uh, neuroendocrine tumors arise from the neural crest cells in, a, in a, a, a developing embryo, and these cells migrate to different parts of the body, and they can be found in many different organs. They can be found in the lung, in the bronchial tree, in the GI tract, in the pancreas, and uh, lower down in the GI tract as well, in the rectum and anus. Uh, neuroendocrine tumors have the potential of secreting hormones and peptides. Some of them may be functional and can produce very specific symptoms related to these hormones or peptides. And uh, actually, many of them are non-functional and do not uh, produce uh, peptides. We're going to be talking, how does this work? We're going to be talking about um, uh, some of the tumors where they arise and the symptoms they can produce in the pancreas specifically. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, call attention to this schema right here. This is a, uh, a um, schema of a uh, neuroendocrine cell. 
And what's important about this, and this picture, by the way, is going to pop up two more times in my lecture and maybe several more times in, in the other presenters' lectures as well. So take note of this, because anybody who can draw this accurately at the end of today's uh, presentations at 4 o'clock is going to get a prize from Mary Ann. <laughs> this cell represents the molecular uh, 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 pathways that are seen in neuroendocrine tumors. And molecular pathways is a term that you're going to hear more and more, not just in neuroendocrine tumors, but in a lot of other uh, uh, cancer uh, uh, um, topics. Molecular pathways, in my opinion, is going to be the basis of all treatment for cancer in the future. Once we get a handle on the molecular pathways that, that promote tumor cell growth, we can target them and then treat them. So molecular pathways, a key word and a key takeaway word. In neuroendocrine tumor cells, there are two major uh, pathways we're going to talk about uh, today, and that is the somatostatin receptors right here. And somatostatin receptors, when they're stimulated, can promote um, cell cycle activation, protein synthesis, cell proliferation. Another uh, molecular pathway that's important is the mTOR pathway. And the mTOR pathway, mTOR is, stands for molecular uh, uh, target of rapamycin. This is, I, I look at this as a hub. If you look at where this is in, in this schema, uh, it's, it's kind of like a hub. And this mTOR target can be stimulated by a whole slew of growth factors, okay? So growth factors come down the pathway and stimulate mTOR. mTOR then, when it's stimulated, promotes protein synthesis, angiogenesis, which is production of uh, tiny blood vessels that feed the tumors, and cell metabolism, and, they, and the cell grows and spreads. So the mTOR pathway is a real uh, important molecular target, as well as the somatostatin receptors. Uh, okay, this is basically uh, a slide that um, uh, demonstrates the different areas of the body where these uh, neurocrest cells can migrate, and then have the potential for developing into neuroendocrine tumors. The bronchial tree, the foregut, the midgut, and of course the hindgut. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are a unique subgroup. It's different and, and separate from uh, the run-of-the-mill pancreatic cancer that you see uh, um, uh, promoted uh, on television a lot. The Lust Garden Foundation, for example, promotes research for uh, pancreatic cancer. That's not a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, otherwise known as peanuts, are, are unique. This is the Steve Jobs cancer. This is the cancer that is, can be slow growing, can linger, but can produce many different uh, um, uh, symptoms that are kind of unique. They arise from the pancreatic islet cells, which are the endocrine cells in the pancreas. And therefore, they have the potential of producing insulin, glucagon, VIP, and pancreatic polypeptides. The incidence of neuroendocrine tumor has been rising dramatically. Uh, all neuroendocrine tumors, most um, uh, dramatic is, is the rise in lung and small intestines. The uh, uh, other ones are a little less dramatic, but they're still rising. And this is uh, with SIA data, there are three different SIA data studies, and they all show a progressive rise in the incidence of uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors are also rising faster than any other malignancies. If you take all other malignant cancers, um, this is the incidence over the years, again from the SIA databases, but neuroendocrine tumors rising. And it's not confined to the United States. This is a worldwide uh, 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 phenomenon, and uh, not only are there organizations in the United States dedicated to neuroendocrine tumors, but there's the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society and uh, uh, research going on in Europe as well. 
So um, the exact reasons for this increase in incidence is not known. Perhaps due to improved diagnosis, perhaps due to increased awareness thanks to groups like, like ours, and uh, maybe from environmental factors, but it's really not been not known, like most cancers. Okay. This slide is the most important one to take away from this group of slides, and that is that although the incidence is rising, it's localized tumors that are rising. And this, I do believe, is uh, due to the uh, yeoman's work by uh, pioneers like Dr. Warner and groups like, like our group here, Dr. Uh, the, uh, the uh, CCAN network, where it, these neuroendocrine tumors are being recognized at earlier stages. Really critical and very, very important. So uh, I think this is a real important fact that we should take away. The most common neuroendocrine tumors are the GI tumors. Not much more we could say about that. Uh, of all GI tumors, including colorectal cancers, uh, exocrine pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancers, et cetera, um, the GI neuroendocrine tumors are the second most common. So among the GI cancers, pretty common. Okay. So as Mary Ann said, most, uh, most of the time, neuroendocrine tumors are not diagnosed until late stages. Why? Why? That's because during the primary tumor growth, all we get are these vague abdominal symptoms, very difficult to characterize, very difficult to diagnose for any clinician. It's only after the development of some symptoms that may be more uh, attributable to uh, neuroendocrine tumors, flushing, diarrhea, uh, maybe wheezing, uh, then uh, a clinician may be pointed to look for neuroendocrine tumors. So based on that, of course, we see that um, the vast majority of NETs are di often advanced at the time of diagnosis, unfortunately. Neuroendocrine tumors are a progressive disease. It can be slow growing, but it can be progressive. So um, uh, you, you, you may be told that your disease is stable. It may be stable for a while, but eventually it will uh, start growing and treatment or more aggressive treatment may be needed. This is uh, a, a graph of treatment naive patients. So patients are not receiving treatment or patients who have metastatic disease that were randomized uh, to getting no treatment, and the median time to progression was only six months. So now we're going to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about how neuroendocrine tumors are classified. And there's no real s consensus on this, but the WHO classification uh, is, is pretty much widely, widely accepted. Um, uh, perhaps Dr. Warner will go into more detail on this, but the takeaway on this slide is um, we talk about well differentiated and poorly differentiated. Prognosis going from good to poor respectively. And what we look at, what we ask the pathologist to look at are the KI67 index. If it's low, it's a relatively good prognosis. If it's high, it's a relatively poor prognosis. So the key takeaways on this slide, KI67 with good, poor prognosis, but the other key issue here is tumor size, okay? Now, this is the one I want you to look at, any size. That means you could have a tumor with a poor prognosis with a high KI67, but it can be tiny, okay? So small tumor doesn't necessarily mean better prognosis. It all depends on the aggressiveness of the disease. Why is tumor grade important? It's important because survival is clearly associated with tumor grade. Well differentiated tumors uh, have a better survival. Patients with poorly differentiated tumors have a worse survival. Tumor stage, important. Again, clearly associated with survival. Patients with local disease, if a, if a patient is diagnosed early at an earlier stage, they do better 
and patients with metastatic disease. <coughs> okay, so again, just to reiterate, local regional nets have more favorable outcomes but unfortunately, many are diagnosed uh, with advanced disease and have a poor prognosis. So the conclusion for this section, the takeaways are uh, neuroendocrine tumors are malignancies that arise in cells that, ha that uh, normal function is to secrete peptides. These peptides may lead to a, a significant symptomatology, but may also help with diagnosis. The incidence of neuroendocrine tumors has been increasing. Most of the neuroendocrine tumors arise in the GI tract, but not all. And of course, advanced disease portends a poor survival. I'm going to briefly go over diagnosis uh, because I think Dr. Warner is going to go over this in, in a little more detail. Uh, many, many conditions cancers and benign conditions, including menopause, food allergies, neuroses, asthma, uh, 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 irritable bowel, uh, can cause many of the same symptoms that we see in neuroendocrine tumors, and that's why the disease is so difficult to diagnose. And in patients with early neuroendocrine tumors, those presenting symptoms can be very nonspecific and generalized. It's almost as if a mother was bringing uh, uh, a, uh, a, a child to a pediatrician and the child complains, I don't feel good. What's a clinician going to do? What does he have to go on? The symptoms can be so generalized and so difficult to, to uh, narrow down and make a diagnosis. So a patient can present to a primary care uh, uh, physician vague abdominal symptoms, as Marianne alluded to, could be diagnosed in, as uh, irritable bowel. Uh, if the symptoms don't resolve, they could be re uh, referred to a specialist. Multiple specialists can be consulted. The diagnosis remains unclear. Finally, some, a scan uh, can be done or may be done, and an incidental finding of a tumor can be found and leads to a biopsy and the diagnosis. The estimated time, as Mary Ann alluded to, can be as little as five years, as, as, as much as nine years. That gives the tumor plenty of time to metastasize. Uh, again, vague abdominal symptoms, bowel obstruction, jaundice can occur, which may actually uh, move a clinician to make an earlier diagnosis with these uh, complications. Um, the diarrhea uh, uh, that uh, carcinoid patients, uh, neuroendocrine tumor patients, can experience is a, uh, a very specific kind of diarrhea. It's a, it's a very watery diarrhea. It can occur at any time. It usually can wake patients up at night, which is different than uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Those patients are usually not woken up at night with diarrhea. Uh, other symptoms can be glucagonoma, zoliger ellison which is an uh, a, a increase in gastrin, so uh, a very severe, unrelenting heartburn can be a, a symptom, and hypoglycemia. So uh, glucagonomas uh, can cause an uh, increase in um, uh, blood sugars and hypoglycemia, that's from insulinomas, low blood sugars. Uh, Dr. Warner, I'm sure we'll go into this in a little more detail, but uh, serum and urine markers can be obtained, which can lead to the diagnosis. Those, uh, that would be uh, 5-HIAA and uh, uh, chromogranin and serotonin levels. Um, these are sensitive markers for uh, neuroendocrine tumors with one caveat, the chromogranin level, uh, chromogranin A level can be falsely elevated by a number of different uh, 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 substances and foods, and it needs to be uh, uh, done in a proper fashion. Okay, so how do we approach a patient? We obviously do a history and physical examination. We look for those characteristic symptoms. We do the markers, and we do some imaging. And I think, uh, again, this is going to be touched on in one of our later speakers, but 
Uh, the imaging techniques that we use now are Octrea scan, CAT scan, or MRI, uh, and uh, for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, PNETs, endoscopic ultrasound is a key uh, imaging technique. What, we, what I don't usually do for uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumor patients is uh, a PET scan, not an ordinary run-of-the-mill PET scan that most uh, doctors uh, are aware of. That is an FDG glucose scan, and uh, that relies on a tumor actively metabolizing radioactive glucose, and that's what's getting picked up on a PET scan. That doesn't happen in neuroendocrine tumors to any large extent, and that is because although neuroendocrine tumors are malignant and although they, they do have the potential of spreading, uh, and and uh, they are not, except for the ones with a high Ki67, the ones that are highly malignant, uh, they will not metabolize glucose at a high rate. So an FDG uh, um, PET scan really doesn't help us that much. It's not in my armamentarium for uh, scanning patients. Later on, we're going to hear about some new PET scans that may be helpful. So now your diagnosis is made, and now you refer to a medical oncologist, someone like myself, and what are we going to do for a patient with a diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor? Treatment is changing. Like anything in oncology, treatment is changing. Many members of my family, even patients, ask me, why did I go into this? I didn't go into this field because it's depressing. I went into this field because Things change all the time. This is a medical oncology, oncology in general, is an evolving field of medicine. I don't do anything now. I don't treat my patients any, any uh, way near of what I treated them five years ago. Ten years ago, forget it. When I started out 30 years ago, I don't even, I don't even think I use any of the same drugs I used 30 years ago. Okay? So things are changing completely. And that's the beauty of, of, of oncology and treating cancer patients. In the past, before we had really even reasonable drugs to treat uh, patients with, we only treated the symptoms of, of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. We wanted to make sure we controlled the symptoms. Still very important, but that was the mainstay of our treatment, controlling the symptoms, preventing, oops, preventing uh, carcinoid syndrome and carcinoid crisis, which is, is uh, the, um, the be all and end all of carcinoid, carcinoid uh, syndrome. Um, so we needed to prevent that because carcinoid crisis was the major cause of death of patients with, with uh, functionally active neuroendocrine tumors. Now, because we've been able to control those symptoms so well, now, the leading cause of death is from metastases, just like any other cancer. So, um, so now we're looking at intervention to treat the malignancy itself. And to do that, we need a team. Now, although I'm out in the trenches and I work alone, I do rely on experts, just like the experts here, and many of them I collaborate with, to help me in treating my patients. The basis of therapy for neuroendocrine tumors are threefold. Surgery, supportive care, and what I call anti-proliferative therapy. Surgery is the primary therapy, may be curative, or palliative. I'm, I'm putting into the surgery group and the palliative group directed therapy and PRRT, which Dr. Odoricio might argue with me, but I think, it, I think for my purposes it belongs in there. So let's go on and talk about surgery as primary therapy. Okay, yeah. Uh, if possible, cut it out. The mainstay of all solid tumors. Uh, not very different than colon cancer or lung cancer. If you can cut it out, cut it out. Do a complete resection. That's going to give our patients the best chance of prolonged survival. If you can't cut it out completely, 
Cut out as much as you can. We call that debulking therapy, okay? And of course, uh, hand in hand with any surgery is proper pre and perioperative and postoperative therapy controlling the possibility of developing carcinoid syndrome and carcinoid crisis and heart disease. Um, I want to mention a couple of things about debulking surgery. Why debulking surgery? If you can't cut it out, why put a patient through surgery? Major procedure, anesthesia, possibility of carcinoid uh, crisis, et cetera. Why put a patient through? Well, it's important because it can decrease tumor load. It may improve symptoms. Uh, by, by decreasing tumor load, you may improve symptoms. You may improve response to systemic therapy. And you may improve overall survival and time to progression. So I think you know, debulking surgery remains an important part of, of our uh, um, procedures. The directed therapies, again, uh, Dr. Odorisi is going to go into this, and I think uh, Dr. Warner might as well, is that uh, we can do hepatic artery infusion with bland embolization or chemoembolization, uh, and that way we can attack uh, isolated liver metastases. We can do radiofrequency ablation. You might know what that is, zapping the tumor. And we can do radioisotope embolization with uh, yttrium-90 microspheres. And we're also going to talk about a little bit later, Dr. Oricio will, about a targeted radiotherapy, PPRT, which is up and coming. And that will be added to an armamentarium, I hope soon, Tom. OK. okay. Again, here's our favorite uh, uh, diagram, uh, supportive care. So the SST receptors, as I mentioned before, is an important molecular pathway in uh, treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. Somatostatin signaling uh, will uh, increase uh, cell proliferation and cell cycle evaluation. And more than 80% of NETs uh, do have those somatostatin receptors. So the use of inhibition of these somatostatin receptors is a key uh, approach to treatment of, uh, of our patients. We currently have the octreotide as a short-acting somatostatin analog, which will block those receptors, and sandostatin LAR, the long-acting uh, uh, preparation. This causes a significant decrease in the number of stools and flushing episodes, uh, a decrease in the 5-HIAA levels, and will improve survival in patients with carcinoid crisis. And we also use it, of course, prophylactically to prevent carcinoid crisis. Side effects from the use of this drug, nothing in the world is without side effects. You could take an aspirin and read the label. You'll never take an aspirin again the rest of your life. Okay. So, abdominal discomfort, bloating, hyperglycemia, and gallstones. And most of patients have experienced one or others of these side effects. Okay. Um, Lanreotide and the long-acting prep, uh, somatolin is very comparable to sandostatin, uh, in my opinion. I don't know if it really adds that much to it, but maybe some of the other guys will, will contradict me on that. Um, okay, so they're highly expressed. Uh, they can inhibit the cell cycle, inhibit growth factor effects, and induce apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So not only does somatostatin help with the symptoms, but it can also decrease the growth of the tumor. Indirectly, it inhibits angiogenesis. Okay, So um, it has the potential to not only provide symptomatic relief, but also disease control. That was published, that was proven and published uh, in the PROMID study where they took patients uh, 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 and uh, that were treated with octreotide, LAR, sandostatin, LAR, and they found that uh, these patients uh, did, had a uh, improved time to progression. So it, it uh, helped um, stop the disease from growing. And these are patients uh, that were um, asymptomatic. So they weren't receiving the sandostatin for their symptoms, but just receiving sandostatin to see if it would decrease tumor growth. Okay, so now we're going to go on to anti-proliferative therapy. Of course, I just mentioned the sandostatin had some anti-proliferative effects as well. Uh, some of the other drugs that are used, interferon, it's, I consider it a second-line approach. 
it's good for patients with low proliferation, those patients that are not highly aggressive, those patients without the high KI-67. Its symptom control is equivalent to sandostatin. It, the anti-proliferation effect it's perhaps a little better than sandostatin. It probably has a little better tumor control than sandostatin. But the onset of action is longer. It takes longer to work than sandostatin. With sandostatin, you'll see a much quicker relief. And the side effects are, in my opinion, much worse than sandostatin, can cause fevers, fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, et cetera. There is some evidence that shows it may be synergistic with sandostatin, that means that if you use the two together, it may have a greater effect than either one alone. We'll go on to chemotherapy. Chemotherapy for mid-gut carcinoids traditionally was not good. Okay. Single agents in the past, fluorouracil, DTIC, adriamycin, streptozotocin were used. Combination therapy did not improve the, res the uh, response rate, remained less than 15%, but just gave you more side effects. So combination therapy really wasn't very good in the past. And of chemotherapy with interferon also didn't really add much to the mix. Chemotherapy for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, is different. So until 2011, Streptozotocin was the only FDA-approved drug and remained the only FDA-approved drug for the past 30 years or so. But in 2011, uh, we had some uh, uh, important news. Um, we found that uh, the mTOR pathway, remember my schema we had on the left side, the mTOR pathway, the mTOR pathway was a prominent feature in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And this pathway uh, uh, was important, as I mentioned, in cell growth, angiogenesis, and metabolism. Okay. And here it is again. And there's the mTOR pathway. And that's the hub. If you could X out this pathway, you've stopped protein synthesis, cell meta metabolism, and angiogenesis, or at least part of the uh, 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 induction of these, of these uh, pathways by inhibiting the mTOR pathway. So the, uh, there was a study that was published in 2010 called the RADIAN-3 trial, and this was patients with, with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and uh, it was compared to placebo, and they found that treatment with an mTOR inhibitor, okay, that's Everolimus, or trade name is Afinitor, uh, improved the median survival. So that, be, that was uh, a very impressive study, and it led very quickly to FDA approval for that drug in May 2011. It showed a doubling of the progression-free survival, and it was the first drug to be approved in over 30 years. And one month later, a second drug was approved. And now with sunitinib, it, the target was a little different. It's a multi-targeted TKI that's a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It acted as an anti-VEGF. It also showed a, uh, uh, an improvement in uh, progression-free survival. But the caveat here is it's FDA approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, not uh, mid-gut carcinoids or mid-gut or hindgut or foregut neuroendocrine tumors. Not that to say that some of us don't try it in, in our patients because it is showing activity, but it's not yet FDA approved. There may be a glitch with some payers for that. Okay, so. Uh, we want to control symptoms, and we want to control growth. Newer targeted therapies are underway. Multi-receptor targeting, we may look at mTOR and somatostatin, we may look at TKIs and, and mTOR, et cetera, and that combination is, is going to be looked at for potential synergistic effects. This little algorithm uh, basically says that when a patient presents with a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, we think of surgery first, and then we think of surgery second, debulking. So we, surgery is always at the top of the list. If there's isolated liver metastases, we can look at a radiofrequency embolization or other uh, uh, liver-directed therapies. If there's a low proliferation, a low KI-67, we have a number of options we can use. High KI-67, we have to look at more aggressive chemotherapy because those patients have a shorter survival and we want to be more aggressive. In the future, we're going to look at 
uh, the uh, L-DOTA, and we're going to look at experimental protocols. Uh, takeaways, promote early de detection. That's what, we're here, that's what we're here to do. That's what we want you to spread the word. Uh, talk to your general doctors. Let them know so that they are more attuned to it. Uh, we want to decrease this delay five years, as Marianne said, is completely unacceptable. Early symptom recognition, the use of biochemical testing and tumor imaging can help. We want to address more than just symptom control. We want to look at future targeted therapies. We want to look at combinations. We want to be able to attack. The key is attack. And of course, we need a team approach. I don't do surgery. I don't do radiofrequency ablation. I do uh, systemic therapy. We need a, you need a good surgeon. You need a good gastroenterologist. You need a good uh, 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 interventional radiologist. And you need a good oncologist. You need a real team approach for this. Okay. The future. What's up for us in the future? Uh, we're going to have new biomarkers, hopefully. We're working on them. Some of them are approved locally. New York states have been very difficult in, in approving uh, tests for new biomarkers. We're going to get better uh, molecular imaging, and we're going to get uh, better scanning. We're going to have, hopefully, uh, some more uh, um, uh, 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 somatostatin analogs to use. Uh, we ha we're going to have pas uh, pasireotide soon, and uh, hopefully, and um, that trial, I believe, is still underway, isn't it? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yes, in the United States. Yeah, still underway in the United States. And uh, what we thought was the future five years ago is now reality. Uh, some antistatin analogs are used in combination more and more. Uh, we're we are, have trials now with PRRT, and that soon will, will be approved. And uh, we're going to use uh, uh, sunitinib maybe in combination uh, with uh, everolimus and somatostatin analogs as combination therapies. There have been tested with bevacizumab, which is Avastin. It's kind of plus minus on those trials. Uh, but uh, these are all coming into the future for uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and of course, everolimus and sunitinib has already been uh, uh, established in our armamentarium for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And um, before I conclude, do you have that last slide? I promised Marianne and Bob that I would not do anything political, but <laughs> my conscience got the better of me. So this was in, fr I think it was in Friday's or Thursday's Newsday, uh, yesterday's Newsday. And uh, it's little, the, unfortunately, the politicians, whether you're Democrat or Republican, uh, they're really, they didn't uh, understand the ramifications of the sequestering and how it hit uh, not just your garbage collection. It's hitting everything. And it's hitting cancer care dramatically because not, it's a 2% cut across the board in all federally funded programs, Medicare and Medicaid. And um, the problem is not so much the doctor's fees. We can all work for 2% less. We've been working for 2% less every six months uh, down the line. That's not an issue. The problem is the drugs. And they, they probably didn't realize, uh, and I, I'll give the, the benefit of the doubt to the politicians that they probably didn't know, because if they knew, they should all be shot. But uh, that they probably didn't know that this 2% is hitting the drugs. And as you probably are aware, drugs like Sandostat and LAR are quite expensive. And they're taking 2% off the top of the drugs. Now, approximately 10 years ago, the, the, the federally funded programs like Medicare and Medicaid mandated that physicians do not make money on the drugs. We've never made money on these drugs. Okay? We, even if we provide it to the patient, it's called a buy and bill, we buy it and then bill it, even that, we break even. Now they're taking 2% away. So many doctors will not be able to withstand that loss. Okay, and you're going to see, like this article said, there are, are some oncologists that are now turning away their cancer patients that have Medicare until this is resolved. I think that's a travesty, personally, but 
I can see where, you know, if it's going to, you, you can't go belly up on this, but you got to help your patients. So I implore you, in addition to all the stuff that you're doing, and I know you guys are doing a lot of uh, advocacy type stuff, you got to call your congressman uh, and you got to let them know what's going on and at least carve out Medicare and Medicaid from the sequestration until it's resolved. Thank you. Thank you.